Raman Chima, Asia Pacific Policy Director at Access Now and the Chair of the Internet Freedom Foundation. He is a, a, a parliament pre-process geek and Abar also told me that he's obsessed with science fiction. at an event celebrating the right to privacy, uh, incredibly private information about me. <laughs> uh, on that, firstly, it's fantastic to see so many of you out on a Saturday evening. I, I'll launch straight into it. You've heard a bit about what I'm apparently interested in and different areas. I, I know that many of you are interested in the right to privacy, and when you hear the word privacy, you hear the word surveillance. Uh, I work neck deep in the subject, so for me, privacy and surveillance often has a very specific context around government access to data, our interception, communication, surveillance, mass surveillance, but also about more boring police people, and I know there's this part of criminal procedure later, so also investigatory powers, right? When can X official of the state be able to access your data in various ways because they're legitimate things. The other thing about people who look at privacy and surveillance, um, the couple of things that break down, some so top myths. One, oh, you know, privacy advocates ask for no surveillance. No, very practically nobody does. Everyone recognizes that there are different forms of activity which may implicate, uh, uh, which may require surveillance, whether it's by state actors, but also by other actors in between or the private sector. The other thing that's broken down a bit over the last few years has been this sort of binary, and as I started my conversation with you, on state surveillance versus private sector surveillance. The book's out, and I encourage you to read it. It's a nice big thick one, but surveillance capitalism is what one is describing as the very practices that are there in the data sector. That's useful for us. It is also a little bit challenging because it sometimes makes us merge the more technical concepts of data protection with existing sometimes nearly 200 or 300 year old law on controlling government surveillance. But it's useful for us to understand that at a basic political level, we have concerns around access to data. Now, what I want you to think about on the Puttasamy judgment, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer who looks more sometimes at parliament and, and process, but obviously I've read the Puttasamy judgment several times. What I leave you to think about the fact is I am actually not celebrating the Puttasamy judgment. I don't think it's revolutionary. I think it's incredibly powerful. But the Puttasamy judgment is actually more important because it's evolutionary. It has built on many, many decades and different elements of Indian fundamental rights law other parts of human rights law as well. Some of you who followed the case closely also know that one of the small sardonic or sarcastic points that many privacy lawyers sometimes make is the Supreme Court did not create a fundamental right to privacy, it upheld it. It said that government lawyers, and I'll be categorical, government lawyers at that time argued that there was no fundamental right to privacy. For whatever reason, I don't want to why. But they stated there's no fundamental right to privacy. Our Supreme Court said yes, there is, and it evolved the right further and created a wealth of standards there, standards that are complex to unpack, but sometimes surprisingly simple, which improve the standards in terms of how privacy is protected in this country. I would argue, and I've written in more detail elsewhere, so like a good lawyer, I'm citing my other work, I'm stating <laughs> that they are simple standards about necessity and proportionality, where the Indian Republic has finally, in a sense, categorically embraced global human rights law on this point with that of other democracies, which recognize the tensions in place sometimes on issues of surveillance and privacy. But also what the judgment did was it evolved on what previous people have done. It evolved on the PUCL standard. For those of you familiar, the People's Union for Civil Liberties, uh, which a landmark Indian organization which challenged this particularly in the 90s about telephone tapping. And it outlined a very clear, strong precedent about surveillance communications. But what I want you to do a little bit more is don't just think about evolution, revolution. The point about the Puttasami judgment is not about its celebration, it's about its use. Any legal standard is only as good as its usage. Especially standards that apply to the control of state power. And I say this not necessarily saying that the state shouldn't exist or the state shouldn't have strong powers, of course it should. The reality is anything that has power often needs to be contained whether it's the union government, whether it's the central government, or whether it's a crazy council in MCD, or a horrible like engineer who's controlling your no neighborhood, they can all misuse this, particularly when it comes to communications access. And the thing about digital communications is it's allowed us all to communicate massively. It has also increased the ability to access data in a remarkable way. One statistic often cited during the going dark debate, which has been a debate in the United States, around the fact that the FBI and other law enforcement can't always access encrypted data, is they said actually it's a trade-off. Before the 90s, there's large amounts of communication that people could not access because it wasn't digital, it wasn't easily available, it was one-to-one. -one. Instead of calling people, I'll like talk to them. 
but I'll send a, 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 a you know a, a postcard or a letter. A postcard obviously you can openly see. A letter you have to physically open. It still requires time and effort. Whereas now digital communication, there's massive amounts of data, much more metadata. The fact that, for example, I may have messaged X person or Joanne, who from the Internet Freedom Foundation, called me at X time for the event, obviously desperately saying get here in time. These things give you patterns, but that was not possible before the 90s. You have it now. In order to control this, you need to use the Puttasami standard, which means you need to go to court. A judgment is as useful, is only as good as the next time it is used by a court of law. Not always by judges. Is it used by officers? Is it used by lawmakers? What's also compelling with the Puttasami judgment is the fact that MPs, who, as you sometimes know, like to trash judges on the fact of exceeding their brief, repeatedly have mobilized around the Puttasami standard. In the recent amendments to the Alhar. I mean, uh, to the Aadhaar Act, the Puttasani judgment was read out by at least seven MPs across different political parties. And why I flag this is the issue of surveillance is the most important piece there. What I want you to just think about in the Puttasami judgment is this. There is much more going on when it comes to regulating surveillance in democratic in a democracy than is there just in court. Uh, and it's definitely beyond just the Puttasami case. There is a significant Ministry of Home Affairs challenge ongoing. I admit uh, also an interest there, the Internet Freedom Foundation, of which I'm chair, it tried one of those cases, challenging the powers of the Ministry of Home Affairs to rather notification by which they expanded the number of agencies that can order surveillance. But also the law that, that provided that. A 2008 amendment to the Information Technology Act passed in the days right after the Bombay terror attacks. But there are many other discussions around surveillance taking place. In Parliament itself, for example, there's been a 183% increase in the number of questions asked on the issue of privacy between the previous Parliament, that is the Parliament uh, during the UPS time, to the Lok Sabha during the in, to, during the Prime Minister Modi's first term, and there's of course going to collect data on this current one. And most of the questions on surveillance come from the lower levels. It, don't, it does not come from the Rajya Sabha, which as you may regard as being opposition controlled sometimes, or for example, being more senior MPs. People in the lower house are asking questions on what's going on there. The thing that I also want to leave you with, two points, and I'm going to wrap up. One, learn from the Snowden revelations, but don't let that only color what you're thinking about surveillance. By that, I mean, sometimes when you think of the Snowden revelations, we just think of our threats to privacy from the National Security Agency, or what laws they have there, or conversations around that. There are many debates on surveillance that have taken place in this country over the last 20 years. Mr. Arun Jaitley, who passed away, uh, as you know, today, he, for example, triggered a public debate around the fact that call data records were being accessed. And we start in, must start interrogating and document what we are tracking in terms of overbroad surveillance in our republic. And the last thing I also want to, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is just this. What is today may not always be and perhaps it shouldn't always be. And what I mean by that is there are certain things that you take for granted. The fact that government can't easily access some of your encrypted communications, for example. The response to that I sometimes make is that government can't access it. That doesn't mean that there aren't ways they can do it. You can re-engineer technologies, but there's massive harm that may come about. And I sometimes remind engineers, just because something is technically, uh, what's the term for it, it's non-trivial effort, doesn't mean that it can't happen. More importantly, something that we think is granted for today. Ask any civil servant about how wiretaps are done. Doesn't mean that perhaps that should be the way. Judges perhaps can oversee surveillance orders. Perhaps we do need a change in the system. And that change in the system is needed because sometimes it is about us challenging what's happening. And the anecdote I'll leave you with is I uh, had a friend who was a senior civil servant, I won't name whom, who was talking once and discussed that in his first day as a state home secretary, he was given a two-page piece of paper and asked to authorize the wiretaps of 800 people based on two pages of paper with around eight, eight lines of text. His response was, I refused and said, give me doc more documentation. Explain to me why. Because somebody might take me to the high court. And he not looked over at the, the crowd next to him, which had three to four lawyers. Imagine the state home secretary who doesn't do that. And that is why sometimes we need to increase and build our institutions because it's not personal. Everyone can make mistakes. Everyone is subject to political pressures and interests, and our republic deserves better institutions, particularly when it comes to the issues of surveillance reform. I'll leave you with that.